Shalom, you're watching Arutz Sheva TV. I'm Yonah Kempinski, and this is our Daily Edition. Today the question being asked in Israel is, are there tunnels also in the north? The chief of uh, Northern Command, Major General Yair Golan, met last month with uh, mayors of communities near Lebanon and addressed concerns from residents that Hezbollah is actively digging tunnels towards Israel. Golan said that the IDF is prepared to deal with any attempt to act against the inhabitants of the region, including against Hezbollah. However, no security protocols have been enacted yet to actively combat the problem. But despite statements by military leaders, sources say that quietly the IDF acknowledges a very real threat from terror tunnels in southern Lebanon and has not ruled out the possibility of their existence, Arut Sheva learned Wednesday. Reservists who have recently arrived to serve the Lebanese border told Arut Sheva that their own IDF officers have great concern for the presence of tunnels from Lebanon to Israel and that instructions were given along the northern borders to dig to search for such tunnels. The IDF decided to contact the local military outpost on the Lebanese border as well due to high fears of the presence of a tunnel just below the military post and that Hezbollah terrorists could decide to blow up the tunnel causing mass casualties. Soldiers also stated that Hezbollah terrorists have come very close to Israel's borders before during infiltration attempts and that they know everything they need to know to launch an attack. IDF rejected the claims and said that the IDF does not specify about preparations on the border. American journalist Steven Sotloff, who was uh, brutally beheaded by the Islamic State terrorist, was Jewish and Israeli. Sotloff took uh, great risks to keep his Jewish faith in captivity. A former fellow captive, the murdered journalist told Idiot Hornot, according to the report, Sotloff fasted on Yom Kippur, only telling his captives that he had no appetite. Today, it was revealed that Sotloff was in fact Israeli. He immigrated in 2005 by himself and studied at the Interdisciplinary Center IDC Herzliya. The fact that he was Israeli and the fact that he was Jewish were concealed in order to refrain from worsening his situation in captivity. Filmmaker Matthew Van Dyke, who was good friends with both Sotloff and James Foley, uh, spoke today about the two journalists who were out there uh, in the dangerous areas trying to get the story out. Both of them were fully aware of the dangers, but they believed that the story needed to be told and, and they weren't going to let the risk stop them. Um, they were both journalists that, that were careful. You know, they took precautions and unfortunately, even if you do everything right, sometimes in Syria things go wrong. I believe the United States should negotiate in the case of ISIS because Europe chooses to pay ransoms, which, which undermines the position of the U.S. and U.K. anyway. Furthermore, ISIS has so many sources of revenue, including the oil sales and the extortion and the taxes, that they're not reliant on ransom payments. So we're not keeping the organization alive by paying the ransoms. So I would propose that they pay the ransoms, get our people back, and then kill ISIS before they get to use the money anyway. You know, ISIS has been focused regionally, but now that the United States has conducted airstrikes, they've made it clear their intention to strike back at the United States, and they've executed two of our citizens. So it absolutely is a threat. It's a growing threat. A number of members of ISIS, perhaps thousands, have European passports or American passports that allow them to cross the borders. So it's definitely a major security threat at this point that, that exceeds even that that Al-Qaeda posed. Mayor of Efrat, Oded Revivi, spoke uh, today with Arut Sheva about the recent uh, reactions to the decision to uh, declare or define uh, 4,000 dunams in the area of Gush Etzion as state land. And as uh, Revivi explains, the issue was mainly registration, not annexation. The power of words is well known. Sometimes just by one word, you can express a whole lifetime belief. In a way, we've been used to already people who don't agree with our rights in living in Judea and Samaria, accusing us of living on the occupied territories. In the last week, we've been exposed to a new term, annexation. Despite the fact that the State of Israel didn't do any annexation, despite the fact that no legal change has happened, despite the fact that Israel has only decided to redeclare state land as what was declared state land already at the time of the Turks, people are starting to accuse Israel of 
annexation. That needs to be stopped right now before we get used to it like occupied territories. Dozens of uh, residents of the south uh, broke into a uh, meeting of the Knesset Finance Committee Wednesday. <laughs> They were protesting that instead of discussing age of their region that was hard hit in Hamas rocket war, the committee was debating the 0% VAT housing bill. As the discussion gave way to the protest, uh, Knesset member Nissan Slomiansky, chairman of the committee, remarked, the finance committee under my direction is doing all it can do to help residents of the South. And after a quickly approved compensation, including advance payments already paid to businesses and residents of the Gaza Belt for 1.5 billion shekels, it will continue to hold serious debates on the topic. The chairman added, it saddens me to see the opposition cynically using the residents of the South while taking over the committee meeting in a bullying fashion. The need to aid residents of the South is beyond political debate and requires thorough care. Accusing the Knesset opposition, Slomiansky charged that they brought the residents of uh, the South to distract the committee from the controversial VAT law and that such a move was cynical and embarrasses the Knesset. Congressman Elliot Engel and Ed Royce were in Israel and they met with uh, Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman, Defense Minister uh, Moshe Yelon, and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. You've been uh, wonderful supporters of Israel. It's a reflection of the bipartisan support that Israel enjoys in the United States from uh, both sides of the aisle, from uh, every administration, from every president. It's something that we deeply appreciate. The help for uh, Iron Dome and the support for Israel throughout a right to defend ourselves against terrorists who break every norm and every rule and who endanger all of us. They held a press conference in Jerusalem yesterday. In the United States, the good news is that support for Israel is very strong and in the Congress, support for Israel is bipartisan. That means both parties very strongly back the U.S.-Israel alliance and the U.S. stands with Israel. This is a very difficult and dangerous neighborhood and the people of Israel are on the front line every single day uh, defending the way of life, defending democracy. What a sorry situation it is when you pull down that uh, charter of Hamas and realize that there's an organization that's only purpose is the destruction of Israel and an organization that instead of trying to build a future uh, for people is instead fo focused on killing. Prime Minister Netanyahu met with the rabbis of the Tsohar rabbi organization who came to express support, especially following the Protective Edge counterterrorism operation. It's good to hear messages of strength from the leaders of the community supporting our activities and steadfastness. The Tzohar organization's rabbinical staff want to express our appreciation for your leadership and strengthen you at this time. We came here to pray for your success, to strengthen the security forces and the army. As it says, go with your strength and protect Israel. This very simple statement says to me that the creator of the universe will give you strength. We passed trying times. An important part of this test was safeguarding the strength of the people and the great unity of the nation. Mixed feelings this week on the uh, first day of school as the Neveda Kalim Girls High School entered their permanent home and this is after an exile of nine years since the expulsion from Gush Katif in 2005. <laughs> There's a combination of tears and happiness. It's happy to come back to settle permanently after an exile of nine years. It's an amazing feeling. During these days, we do remember the home there in Gush Katif, and we want to come back there, and that's why there's also tears. It's difficult. Parents come over and wish to bless Shechianu over the new campus. For me, it's still hard. But with God's help, there is, of course, a big happiness with the students and the new campus. As you can see, the campus is new, the structures are new, but we felt it important to bring the old original sign from Gush Katif. We renovated it a bit, and you can see it here. It symbolizes the continuity.
Okay, that'll be all for today. Until next time, from all of us here at Arutz Sheva, IsraelNationalNews.com. Shalom.